joy. Oh, sing a fragrant flower's breath and of the sinless boy. For now the flowers on Nazareth in every heart may grow. Now spreads the fame of his dear name on all the winds that blow. Oh, sing a song of Galilee, of lake and woods and hill, of him who walked upon the sea and bade the waves be still. For though like waves on Galilee, dark seas of trouble roll, when faith has heard the Master's word, falls peace upon the soul. Sing a song of Calvary, its glory and dismay, of him who hung upon the tree and took our sins away. For he who died on Calvary from the grave and Christ our Lord by heaven adored is mighty now to save Hebrews chapter 10 Look at verse 37, if you would. Well, I'll tell you, let's pick up at verse 31 and let's just get the context. The Bible says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance." Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Verse 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. I want us to, for a few minutes this morning, speak on this subject. Look up. Jesus is coming. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given to us. I thank you for this great season that we, uh, Father, uh, in many places has been uh, turned away from its true meaning. But I'm glad that we can come here this morning and in this season celebrate the birth of our Savior. But Father, this morning we want to not look at his first coming, but we want to sort of center in on your coming again to get us. And I pray you'd encourage us, speak to our hearts today. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We spent a la the last couple of Sundays and we spoke on the subject of 
the perilous times that we lived in. We, we looked at what the, the job of the, the, the church, the age is the church age in which we live in. It's the, it's the age that God is doing his work through the church. And that work is the great commission today. And it's, so it's the time of the church. It's the time of the great commission uh, we talked about we're not in the day of the Lord, as many in, in Paul was writing and uh, to the church at Thessalonica, many of them thought that they had entered into that period, and, and Paul was writing that book and saying, look, at you, we're not there yet. We're living in the, uh, the, the, the time of, uh, of iniquity, the, the mystery of iniquity that already works. And uh, then we talked about uh, the time of the rapture, and, and, and so I just want to sort of thought, follow up on some of those thoughts. Uh, listen, folks, I, I'm looking for the Lord. We were, we were in the church van last night, and we were riding around going, we were Christmas caroling, and I think Dana was sitting behind me in the seat, and she was talking about seeing... Uh, some big blow up Santa Claus and I'm not even sure where we were going with that conversation but when she said blow up Santa Claus what I heard was somebody ought to blow up Santa Claus and I thought amen <laughs> blow him up <laughs> folks Jesus is coming we come to this season right now and, and we look back and, and all of the prophets and, and all of the scriptures foretold is coming. And even Jesus in the, in the gospels told, told his followers, listen, if you had known the time, you should have known the time. The prophets foretold this time, but they weren't looking for him. They weren't looking for him then. And folks, I'm afraid that many times in many circles, the world's not looking for him uh, today for sure. But I'm afraid the church's not looking for him anymore. And so we come to this passage of scripture this morning. Look up, Jesus is coming. He's coming. We started out this passage here and we looked at verse 31. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And, and, and look at uh, when, when you, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will fall into his hands one of these days. It'll be a fearful thing. There'll be no hope for you. There'll be no help for you. There'll be a certain fearful judgment that is coming on those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Scripture proclaims it, and it's so. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God and not know Jesus as your Savior if you don't know Him today. I beg you right now, trust Christ. Turn to Him. Have your sins forgiven. It's the only way. There is no other way. He says in verse 32, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Remember your salvation. Remember the former days in which you were illuminated. Do you remember the day that you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You remember where you were. I'm not asking you to put a date on it. If you ask me to give you a date that I got saved, I cannot do it. But I can take you to the place that it happened. I know about the, 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 the time frame, but I know it happened because I was there. I can take you to the room. I can, I can take you to the spot when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Do you remember that day? What a glorious day it was. When you asked Jesus to come into your heart, you repented. You knew you were a sinner. You were on the way to hell and nothing could help you but Jesus. You remember that day? And then in faith, you turned to Jesus Christ and trusted him as your only means of salvation. What a day that was, folks. I like to go back to that day often and think of it. Oh, listen, 
we ought to do that. I don't think we ought to go back and wallow in the past and, and the sins of the past. And, and, and for some of you, maybe it was greater than others. But no matter who you are, you were in sin. And when you turn to Jesus Christ, he delivered you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Remember the day in which you were saved. You remember where you were? You remember the circumstances around it? When the Spirit of God convicted you and you knew that you were, you were helpless, you were hopeless, there's nothing that you could do, and Jesus was your only help, your only hope. What a glorious day. At that moment you trusted Jesus Christ, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and nothing could ever separate you, uh, could, could come between you and Him again. Nothing could take you out of His hand. Uh, your, your salvation was secure. It was, it was real. Remember those days. The writer of Scripture in Hebrew says, the former days in which... After ye were illuminated. You know, I, I've heard people say this before. You know, just get saved and, and all of your troubles will be forever over. If you were told that when you got saved, they lied to you, didn't they? Yes. Amen. <laughs> In many respects, your problem's just begun. That's what he says here in this passage. Remember the former days after uh, ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. You endured afflictions. Remember the day you got saved, Jesus delivered you from your sin, but you entered into a warfare, folks. And there are afflictions, there are troubles, there are trials, there are tribulations that are going to come to every child of God. It's just the way it is. I witnessed to somebody today and they're on the verge of trusting Christ as their Savior. I want to tell them what they're in for. Afflictions are ahead in verse 33. Uh, uh, he begins to explain some of these afflictions. And he says, partly while you... Whilst ye were made a gazing stock. That word gazing stock means that you were, you were, a, you were put on a stage for all to look at. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've got this marker now on you that follows you. And you ought to be different. And as in this life that we live for Jesus as we're different, the world's going to look on us as if we're on a stage. You're a gazing stock. Listen, folks, the world ought to see us as his children, and there ought to be something different about us that causes the world to look on and say, why is that person so strange? Why do they talk different? Why do they not listen to our jokes? Why do they not watch the things that we watch? Why don't they dress the way we dress? I often like to say it this way. You can always go to Walmart and you can tell who the Christians are. Or you should be able to tell who the Christians are. And you become a gazing stock because people look at you because you're not like everybody else. Now listen, folks, just because maybe you dress different from everybody doesn't mean you're a Christian. But I, the, the world's sure going to wonder, what is it about you that you want to... But Paul said part of those afflictions are that you're a gazing stock. You, you've been put on a stage for people to gaze at. In verse 33 also, uh, you were uh, made a gazing stock, both right, by reproaches... And afflictions, reproaches means insults, insults. Listen, folks, just go out and live for Jesus and the insults will come. I've been called a Jesus freak. I've been called a lot of other things that I probably can't say in, in, in company here. Uh, the, the, just the insults will come because you're different. 
Remember the day you got saved? The writers of Scripture says these things will follow. Listen, folks, and if they don't follow, something's wrong. We're not even living the way we should, or maybe we don't even know the Lord at all. Remember, remember, you were saved. You were made a gazing stock. The reproaches, the insults came. By afflictions, the Bible says in verse 33 at the end of it, afflictions mean suffering from outward circumstances. Listen, folks, we're, just because we're Christians doesn't mean it's not going to rain on us. It rains on the just and on the unjust and the outward circumstances, whatever they might be, and they'll take all different kind of forms today. Afflictions, your gazing stock, reproaches, afflictions. Verse 33, at the end of it, look at it. Whilst you became companions of them that were so used, for you had compassion of me in my bonds. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, often those reproaches and those afflictions come because of your associations. Um, listen, folks, I like coming to church because I know you folks are going to be here. You're my associations. You're the, the ones we're talking to. Remember the day you got saved. Remember the day you were illuminated. You were a, you're a gazer. Hey, look, we're all gazing stocks together. We all suffer those insults together, those outward circumstances. We, we walk in those things together, often because of the people that you associate with. Some of these troubles will come. Listen, folks, there are people in this community out here in which we live. They see you walk in the front door out there and they think there's something wrong with you for being here. Not all of them. Some of them are friendly to us. But some of them are not. Just by your association of walking in the door of Shalom Baptist Church. Are you willing to take those things? The Bible says in verse 34, you had compassion of me in my bonds. Uh, you, 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 you weren't ashamed to show compassion. You weren't ashamed to, to, to associate with this group of people. Verse 34, again, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You know, folks, in, in Bible's day, Bible days when a person became a Christian, many times the Roman government would come in and they would take their property from them. It's just, it's just part of what they did. You took joyfully the spoiling of your good for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hey, look at this morning that they come in and took your property for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Would you take it joyfully? Oh, we'd want to get our gun and go shoot them, wouldn't we? But they took it joyfully. There's something wrong with them people. What? Who acts that way? People filled with the Spirit of God. The associations. The, 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 joyful when they robbed you. Hey, look at folks. That, that is, that's what communism does. That's what Hitler did to the Jews in, 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 in that time, in, in that world war, they, they'd go in and, and, and the Jews, they'd take all their property, just everything they, they had, and they were out destitute. The Bible said when they did that to Christians, and you took it joyfully. I'm not sure that I'd do that. If I had a biblical mindset, it would be a lot easier, but I'm afraid we don't have that biblical mindset a lot today. How did they do that? Look at verse 30. Let's read verse 34. You had compassion 
of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing that in yourselves, look at it, here's how they did it, that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Hey, look, at you have everything I've got. I've got my eyes on heaven. That's where my treasure is today. <laughs> we got our eyes on everything today but heaven. Oh, we all want to go, right? I'm getting up a bus load right after church. Who wants to go right after church this morning? What a day that will be, folks. When our eyes will be on, if we just get our eyes on heaven. It helps us to get through these other things. You endured uh, afflictions. You were a gazing stock. You, the, the insults and the outward circumstances that came that caused afflictions. Uh, because of your associations and you weren't afraid to show compassion to, to those of like mind. Hey, look at folks. There's a heaven out there to be gained for us. This is not the end. Jesus is coming. He says in ther verse 35, look at it. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For, if you, for ye have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Don't lose your confidence today. Oh, remember the day you got saved. What a joyful day it was. That burden of sin fell off your shoulders and you just felt like you could walk on air. He says here in this passage, don't lose your confidence. In other words, don't lose your faith. It's a matter of being convinced that Jesus and Jesus alone is Lord and Savior. That's what you believed the day you got saved. Now 35 years later, 25 years later, 60 years later, 12 years later, 2 years later, 2 minutes later. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your confidence in what you believed in. Jesus is still coming, folks. It may look like, did we, did we believe something that wasn't real? You look at the world today, the world that we live in today, and the writer of Hebrews would say, don't lose your faith. The reward is still out there. He says we need to exercise patience in the will of God. Ye, for, for ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God. Listen, folks, just be... You know, that's got to be the hardest thing in the world is to exercise patience. I don't even want to ask for it. Because tribulation worketh patience. <laughs> but we need to exercise patience. Folks, Jesus is coming. Keep doing the will of God. Keep, keep your faith in the thing that you once believed in. And all of the chatter and all of the, 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 the trappings and, and everything that would try to say, you, you people are crazy. Patience. Patience in the will of God. The, the reward is out there and it will be worth it all. That's what the old song says. It will be worth it all when we see Christ. All trials will seem so small when we see Christ. It'll be worth it all. Patience, folks, patience. And then the verse that I want to really drill down on this morning in verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. It's a great verse of scripture right here. It is one of the strongest statements about the nearness 
and certainty of Jesus is coming. The word little, for yet a little while. It, now, we're not Greek students this morning. Well, most of us aren't. There may be some that know a little bit about it. And I say, I, I know a little bit about Greek. I, I knew a little Greek that run a little convenience store down on the corner. <laughs> but let me, let me define some words for you this morning. The Bible says, for yet a little while. The Greek word for little is the word micron. The word micron. It refers to a very small thing. In my studies, I found out that it is a millionth part of a meter. A millionth part of a meter. It's a pretty small thing, right? A millionth part of a meter. Micron, the word micron, is modified by the rep repetition of the word oson. So you could read it like this, for yet a micron... Oson, Oson. Say, preacher, what in the world does that mean? Well, it simply means this. The word Oson, which means so very, so very. So basically what the scripture is saying here, it literally means a little while. How very little, how very little. The scripture emphasizes that in the language for yet a little while, yet a very, very little while, he that shall come will come. Literally, the coming one will come. Christ is called the coming one. It's one of his names. He is the coming one. The, the second coming of Jesus to get his people is so important that it's one of his names. Who's coming? Well, the coming one. Who is it? It's Jesus. He's on his way. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. And the Bible then says, and will not tarry. You ever heard anybody say this? Well, if Jesus tarries... Well, my Bible says he's not going to tarry. The word tarry means to while away in time, to linger, to delay, to defer. In, in other uh, uh, parts of scriptures, it's translated delay. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 48, but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. It's that same word for tarry. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and apport him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, the coming of Jesus Christ is emphasized in this one verse in four different ways. Look at it. He's coming in a little while. Yet a little while. He's coming. Yet in a little while, very little, very, so very little time. He will come and he will not tarry. He's saying it in four different ways. He's coming in a little while, a very, very little while. It's a promise. He will come and he will not delay. Listen, folks, he'll be on time. He'll be on time. He's coming. It has a twofold meaning in this passage of Scripture here. Christ, the coming one, uh, uh, I believe he's described this way because his coming is in intimate, intimate. Uh, Imminent. Uh, better be careful how you say that. <laughs> Just means he could come at any moment. The Bible uh, describes it, it that he's near, he's at hand. 
The Lord is at hand. The, the Lord is at hand means uh, it, it speaks of an approaching time. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 5, but let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It means the time is approaching. It's approaching. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. It's approaching. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Time's approaching. It's drawing near. It's at hand. Revelation 1, 3, Blessed is he that, re that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. It's approaching. I believe Jesus is trying to tell us something, folks. Revelation 22, 10, He saith unto me, Seal not the saying of this prophecy of this book. For the time is at hand. The word at hand means that it's approaching. We see that uh, demonstrated in other passages of Scripture. In John chapter 7, the Bible says, Now the feast, uh, now the Jews, feast of tabernacle was at hand. They were going into that feast of tabernacle. There are seven a biblical feast that are mentioned uh, in the Old Testament for the Jews. And, 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 and in this, they, they were going into the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and it says, it's at hand. The time is approaching. And it's the same, same concept when it talks about the coming of the Lord. It's at, it's at hand. It's approaching. In John 11 and 55, the Jews' Passover was at hand. And many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. It was one of the feasts when all the Jews went to Jerusalem for that feast. And that time was drawing near. It was time to go. It was at hand. In John chapter 19 and verse 42, There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was at hand. Jesus died and they took him down uh, from the cross because of the, the, the preparation day and uh, they, they couldn't touch a dead body and, 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 they, and, and the, the sepulcher was at hand right before the preparation day. So they took him and put him in the sepulcher because it was near. And so the Lord is at hand. The time is approaching. The day is near. God knows exactly when the rapture will occur. Now for you and me, we don't know. We don't know when that day will be. But for our part, it's always imminent. It can happen in any moment. It's intended to be a motivator for us. It's intended to be a purifier for us. In 1 John uh, chapter 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. What a motivator, folks, to live for the Lord. He could come at any moment. The Bible says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Hey, listen, folks, if you believe Jesus was coming back today, what in your life would you drop off today? If I could, if I could assure you today at 1230, it's almost 12 o'clock now, that in 30 minutes, Jesus is going to be here. If I knew that for sure, what in our life, what in the next 30 minutes would we do different that we're not doing right now? You see, it's a motivator. It's a purifier. If you believed it was coming in the next few minutes, what would you get on your knees and confess to God? What sin would there be in our life that we'd say, Lord, forgive me before He called us out of here. For yet a little while, and He that shall come will come and will not tarry. The second thing, the time of Christ's coming is described as a little while and you think, well, preacher, now, this is 2,000 years ago. A little while. 
a very little, so very little. We've got to remember who's writing this, right? Who's writing it? Yeah. God is writing it. Second Peter chapter 3. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It's only been a couple days in God's eyes. And so we don't know, do we? But He's coming. We do know that. He didn't, he didn't tell us the exact moment. A thousand years is a day. Uh, a day is, is a thousand years. A thousand years one day. And here's why. And the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a loving, merciful, long suffering God that we have. I don't know, I think Jesus is up there. I can see him sitting on the edge of his seat. Father, you're going to blow the trumpet today? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Now, I'm making this up. Obviously, I don't know this. But I can hear the Father say, not today, not this moment. There's someone sitting down there in Shalom Baptist Church this morning that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I'm long-suffering. And I'm not willing that any should perish, and I want that soul to be saved today. Oh, listen, if you're here this morning, you don't know Him. He's waiting on you. And you mark it down, folks. One of these days, that last soul is going to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the trumpet's going to sound. And Jesus is going to come and get His bride. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the ark, with a shout with the voice of the archangel. Dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, to meet the Lord with them in the air. And folks, I believe that day is drawing nigh. In a little while, a so, so very little while, folks, the debauchery in this world is growing by leaps and bounds every day. And I don't know how bad it's going to get before the Lord comes back, but it's gotten pretty bad to this point. Look up. Jesus is coming. I think the imminent coming of Christ is emphasized in this passage as a comfort for, for those of us that know Him. He's coming to get us. Paul's saying, stay, he's saying, stay steadfast in your trials and your tribulations and your being a, a gazing stock and, and all the insults that fly your way. Boy, just, just think about it. You're out there on the street and you're giving a track out to someone. I was down in Salamanca one afternoon and I was getting gas and there was a guy on the other side of the, the pump and he was pumping gas. I walked around and gave him a, 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 a gospel track. So I'd like to tell you about Jesus. And he took it, tore it up in my face, threw it down on the ground and stomped on it. But wouldn't it have been great if Jesus would have come at that moment? Now, it wouldn't have been great for him. But as you're suffering that persecution, that, that, those insults, those reproaches for his name, and the trumpet sound, and out of here we go. I was uh, years ago teaching a, a Bible study uh, in my workplace where I worked in a grocery warehouse and oh, every vice under the sun was represented there and I sit and I was teaching this Bible study and this one guy I believe he was a Christian he claimed to be but we were doing the Bible study and he's had this big chaw of tobacco in his mouth and he's running down his cheek and I looked at him and I said brother I said, Jesus is going to come back one of these days. You don't want that stuff to be running down your jaw when he raptures us out of here. 
I'm just saying, folks, it's coming. What are we going to be doing when he gets here? In a little while, in a very, very little while, Jesus is coming. Could that mean today? Amen. It does. A very little while. The rapture, I believe, could happen at any time. If you don't know him, you would enter into that day of the Lord that we talked about last week. Listen, encouragement, folks, for those of us who know Jesus. Look up. He's coming. If you don't know him this morning, you'd be left behind. That doesn't have to be the case. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Nobody's looking around.